and our senior fellow, Alpana Senapati, and uh, she'll share actually a very interesting case that she put together uh, with us. So I think we're gonna have, we're gonna have fun. Dr. Senapati. All right, um, I'm gonna talk about an interesting case that I had um, a little while ago. Um, it's a 79-year-old African-American male. Uh, he presented with dyspnea on exertion, and he had known diastolic heart failure ever since 2014, proximal atrial fibrillation, COPD. He presents really with progressive dyspnea over two weeks with a productive cough and hemoptysis for about three days. And prior to admission, he was class three or class two symptoms with at least two prior hospitalizations within the last year for uh, CHF. He's had at least 20 pound unintentional weight loss. Um, he denies angina, PND, palpitations, or syncope. Uh, his past medical history, he has proximal atrial fibrillation, diastolic heart failure, underlying stage two CKD, and he does have a history of recurrent pleural effusions, mostly on the left-hand side, requiring multiple thoracentesis, uh, hypertension, pulmonary aspergillosis that was treated in the past. Um, family history, cervical history, really nothing significant. He was a longtime smoker, quit uh, in 91, um, no alcohol abuse that we know of, and his medications are listed there. He's on warfarin, 7.5, furosemide, 40 milligrams VID, defetilide for his atrial fibrillation, and uh, really uh, nothing else that was really cardiac-wise significant. So in physical What's exam. So that was, um, so he was new to our institution at that time. Um, so we're assuming he was probably followed up with his P PCP and uh, it, he's not the greatest follow up in terms of uh, whether or not he had a cardiologist that was taking care of him in the past. So that, that's unknown. And his INR was okay? I'm sorry, what? INR was okay? Yes, okay. yes, he was uh, fairly therapeutic most of the time. Okay. Um, so his blood pressure on presentation, the blood pressure is 113 over 75, um, heart rate, so he's normal tensive, heart rate is 84. His afebrile, uh, oxygenating okay. Uh, really what's remarkable, his, uh, his BMI is 16. So this is a, about a six feet tall guy and weighs 120 pounds. So uh, this is uh, fairly cachectic on exam. Um, did have a significant JVD to the angle of the jaw. Um, had a positive S3 and decreased uh, by base lower uh, breast sound. So clinically he was in heart failure. So uh, pertinent labs, um, you know, his creatinine is 1.3, potassium was a little bit up, um, albumin was low, uh, about 2.9. Um, white count was a little bit low as well, and his BMP was elevated, 637, the troponins were negative. His INR was therapeutic, 3.3, um, TSH was normal, and blood pressures were negative. So um, EKG, um, this is EKG, he was, he was sinus at the time, and uh, first degree every block with the left bundle, uh, left axis deviation. He had a chest x-ray which showed that he had a left pleural effusion, and a CT chest uh, due to concern for hemoptysis and a cough um, was performed, and he had small bilateral pleural effusions, more on the left-hand side, extensive diffuse emphasivity changes, he was a long-time smoker, and a left lung base infiltrate atelectus changes as well, so. So for his echocardiogram, um, if you can play some of the images, please. <laughs> so as you can see on the personal long axis, um, uh, ventricle is quite thick um, and also uh, I would say at least uh, mild to moderately depressed. RV looks a little bit sluggish there as well. HR a little bit hard to see, but it looks a little bit enlarged. He does have a pleural effusion there. On color Doppler, you don't see any significant mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation. And the uh, apical forward chamber, you do see that his uh, HR a little bit enlarged. In the subcostal view, you also see that he probably has some RVH as well, right? Ventricle hyperperitrophy. Has a lot of RVH. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Uh, Interatrial septal. Yep. Yeah, so, this, uh, so uh, I'll get it along with some of the, the some of the other interesting findings that he had as well. So in tissue Doppler, as you can see, he had a mitral inflow was um, high E, low A. Um, tissue Doppler is severely um, down. Wow. Um, so you know these are all pointing towards his uh, really. Is bad it like two centimeter per failure. second or something? I can't see from here. <laughs> it's yeah, it's you, almost you, non-existent. It's huh? Fairly non-existent. His tissue Doppler, exactly. So. Um, so you know what, based on the information that you have, what what, what do you think is the most like like diagnosis at this point? 
<laughs> Look at you people go. <laughs> <laughs> They're gone. <laughs> Stop the voting. Yeah, you, right you can now. stop the voting. <laughs> right, turn off the machine. Not metastatic hypertrophic car mob, right? Okay. So, um, question number one, you guys got it. So, you know, this guy had a diagnosis, remember, since 2014, um, and he had an echo actually at that point. We happened to pull it up. And, uh, it, you know, his LE function was pr preserved in 2014, but um, his echo really didn't look that much different. He still had severe concentric hypertrophy. And uh, really to highlight that, this is something that really, really, we really need to think about. Um, so I, on echocardiogram, um, you had a small LV size, about 2.6 centimeters, um, severe concentric LVH, um, biatral enlargement. Um, LV function was depressed, about 40-ish. Um, he had mild to moderate RVH. RV function was also down. And he had small anterior and posterior pericardial fusion and severe um, grade 3 diastolic dysfunction. His pulmonary pressures were up as well. IVC was dilated. So um, this is just some of the distinguishing factors on echo that we have to remember, um, distinguishing cardiac amyloidosis from hypertensive heart disease and HCM. And as you can see, um, really concentric LVH with severe grade 3 diastolic dysfunction, biatrial enlargement, pericardial fusions are all things that we have to think about cardiac amyloid um, versus uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is usually regional septal uh, apical involvement. So these are just some of the things that we need to keep in mind. Um, so echo is also useful. Um, this patient did not have serine imaging at the time of his echo, but uh, one study that was published um, distinguishing um, global longitudinal strain and echo um, uh, in cardiac amyloid compared to hypertrophic carotid the aortic stenosis. So you see this apical sparing pattern that's been well described in literature now for, um, for um, diagnosing cardiac amyloidosis. Now, this is in, in this particular study, they studied about 50 patients or so. They found that the sensitivity was about 93%, and the specificity was about 82%. And um, really, in this, in this case, you can't really distinguish whether it's AL or ATTR. There was no significant difference in uh, with the strain patterns between those two cardiac amyloid types. Um, so this particular study um, that uh, we were involved in really looked at the relative regional strain ratio which was defined as the average of the apical strains divided by the sum of the basal and mid strains. And what we found was patients with low uh, ejection fraction was defined as LV, uh, LV ejection fraction less than 45%, and a high R, uh, regional relative, uh, relative regional strain ratio were found to have the worst prognosis. So not only does this apical sparing strain pattern have diagnostic implications, but also can have prognostic implications for some of these patients. Um, so, you know, based on the information that we have so far, what do you think is the best next step in the management? What, what would you do next? And I think this is a bit controversial, I guess. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I think everybody loves imaging, and this is an imaging conference, so certainly. Um, what we actually went with, and I think it's important to, you know, start from the <laughs> basics. Um, we, you know, we, we want to figure out what type of amyloid is this. You know, this is a 79-year-old gentleman. We want to start off with the basics. You know, we want to check for, ser for serum-free light chain assays. And, of course, keep in mind that we probably need additional imaging modality to further diagnose this patient. So this is his basic workup. Um, so as you can see, he had a little bit of proteinuria, ferritin levels were normal. Kappa lambda ratio was a bit high of 2.3. However, keep in mind that he's 79, and you know, up to five to six percent of his population probably has um, some sort of plasma cell disorder. And up to 20 percent, or even higher than that, with the TTR, cardiac amyloid has some sort of plasma cell disorder. Discrasia as well. So, you know, it's, 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 it's helpful, but I don't think it's diagnostic, especially in these older populations. And if you're suspecting ATTR, then you really need to uh, do some other testing to uh, kind of delineate whether it's AL or TTR. So, this is card so we proceeded to cardiac MRI to further figure out what was going on with their patient. And if you can play the videos, please. So as you can see here, um, this is the, uh, his cardiac MRI. As you can see here, severe concentric LVH, also um, RVH by atrial enlargement. And the right-hand side, you see this corresponding delayed enhancement imaging. And, you, and as you can see here, he has just diffuse transmural pattern delayed enhancement imaging involving not just the ventricles, but also his atria. So his LV um, endoscopic volume was small. His LV mass was 
large, um, and his L uh, in intraventricular uh, septum was 2.2 and posterior wall was 2.2, so quite thick ventricles. And uh, what we found was his LV function was about 60%. Um, his moderately depressed LV function, my, um, mild bilateral enlargement, severe concentric LVH, and a diffuse LV and RV enhancement. This is all consistent with cardiac amyloidosis. Now, the car uh, cardiac MRI is great for diagnosis of uh, cardiac amyloidosis, but it doesn't really tell you what this AL or TTR, so you need to really kind of figure out which one it is. So which of these are poor prognostic markers in cardiac amyloidosis? Okay, great. So we know that yeah, right patients on. that are symptomatic and have bad um, impaired relaxation, elevated fluid pressures have poor prognosis. Troponin T and um, pro-BMP have also been shown to have poor prognosis. Um, and diffuse gadolinium enhancement cardiac MRI, which I'll talk about a little bit, um, has also been shown to be diagnostic and prognosis, prognostic as well. So, um, so the cardiac MRI findings in um, cardiac amyloidosis. So this study um, was done in about 250 patients or so, and looked at really the the pattern of delayed enhancement in um, in patients with cardiac amyloidosis. And what they found was it varies. Um, so some patients don't have any delayed enhancement. Some patients have diffuse transmural pattern of delayed enhancement, and some patients have a patchy uh, patchy delayed enhancement. And what they found was um, the patients that had the transmural pattern, the diffuse pattern, like our patient, carried the worst prognosis. Um, and this varied between AL or ATT or AL patients typically um, do a little bit worse. Um, they have about one and a half years uh, survival over um, at the time of diagnosis. And TTR patients are typically older, um, more indolent process, uh, more indolent disease, and typically do a little bit better than these patients. So really, I think this was a nice study. And uh, based on this um, a meta analysis that was done, the sensitivity is about 85% specificity, about 92% for detecting cardiac amyloidosis. OK. Uh, so which imaging modality has the highest specificity for detection of cardiac amyloidosis? I think everybody got this right. So great. So um, technetium pyrophosphate scan. So uh, on the upper right-hand corner is our patient's um, technetium um, pyrophosphate scan. And we did it because we wanted to figure out, you know, whether this is wild type or senile amyloidosis, a TTR amyloidosis. So here, um, his, his test was positive, And as you can see on the uh, right-hand side, he had uh, just a, a strong uh, uptake of technetium pyrophosphate um, consistent with uh, uh, senile transferase and cardiac amyloidosis. And really, how to calculate this, you take the heart to contralateral lung, lung ratio, and anything greater than 1.5 is considered a positive result. And um, I thought this was a really uh, interesting study that came out actually hot off the press, um, published in Jack Imaging just this month. And um, what they did was, um, was interesting. So what, what they found was we see this apical sparing pattern on echo. Um, so what they did was they performed um, technician power process scans in TTR patients. What they also found was there was decreased uptake um, in the apical segments, and there was increased uptake in the basal mid segments. So which is which is nice because it's concordant with the um, echo findings of strain patterns. So there really is something to this apical sparing pattern that we see in um, um, uh, amyloid. So, uh, you know, in summary, what they found was they had decreased uptake in the apical segments and uh, more uptake in the mid to basal segments, mimicking the apical sparing longitudinal strain as seen on echo. And this also had um, diagnostic and prognostic implications. And this test was 100% specific for TTR amyloid. And I think what's, what's more important, I think, really is um, that we just need to increase awareness um, of uh, TTR amyloid especially. Um, um, a couple studies that have, uh, that have come out really um, looked at the prevalence of TTR in our HEFPEF population as well as our aortic stenosis or tower population. It was almost as high as 17% with our HEFPEF population so that, missed, that was admitted for heart failure, and up to 16% with TTR in our tower population. So I think in the future, this is something that we need to start thinking about in terms of, you know, um, looking at prognosis in these, pop, uh, on these, in these patient populations that undergo TAVR. 
So um, in summary for our clinical course for our patients, so he was relatively sick when he came in. Um, he was transferred to the ICU for respiratory failure, requiring BiPAP, underwent a bronchoscopy that was negative for infection and a malignancy and was treated for pneumonia and our heart failure team was consulted at that time. And he was 79, so a heart transplant, unfortunately, was preclusive to his age. And because he had a positive um, technician pyrophosphate scan, um, really at this time, we don't really have any um, FDA-approved ther therapies for this type of cardiac amyloidosis. It's all a phase, a phase two and phase three trials, although I think something may be coming out uh, later this year uh, in terms of um, uh, results. And um, palliative was consulted, and he's uh, at least had two, at least, uh, actually more than that, two or three hospitalizations since his diagnosis. So he's uh, kept on optimal heart failure medical therapy, but at the same time, you know, there's really nothing um, at this point that we can do for this patient other than just kind of follow him very closely and treat his heart failure. So very thank good. You very good. Excellent. Excellent.